the world that I devoted the majority of my life to, and the world that you're about to devote a huge chunk of your life to, is in in every sense a love affair. And I make no, it's, it's not kind of, I'm not being over, overly poetic. It really is, with all the kind of dramas and ups and downs and everything else that, that come with love affairs. If the, for this to work, these, these eight, ten seminars we're going to spend, the time we're going to spend together, would depend hugely on your ability to, as it were, to squeeze this lemon, to get the most out of me, to ensure that I actually do deliver, answer your questions, deal with, deal with your questions, and don't, don't duck and avoid them. So I really, in a sense, hope I'm going to get you to enter my life, look at the challenges as I saw them. Obviously, to an extent, some of them are a little bit dated, because my career started 40 years ago. Uh, but believe me, there are innumerable parallels to the problems you're going to face, because the essential problems that uh, are going to hit you as creators are exactly the same as the ones that, that I had to navigate my way through during the whole of my career. There is a combination of serendipity, teamwork, hunch. Connecting all that stuff up is what you're going to have to do. And then, most important of all, the tenacity to drive that idea through. You don't point just having an idea. You then got to decide which of your ideas have got value, which of your ideas you think you might be able to find a market for, a market to the extent that they, you can get them financed, and then the sheer willpower and tenacity to drive them through. Someone asked me many, many years ago, you know, well, how does a movie get made? And I said, actually, you reach a point where you're so in love with the idea, you refuse to allow it not to get made. Some ideas are utterly priceless, absolutely priceless. I like to think that if someone had walked through my door with this idea, I would have locked the door and not let them out until I had a contract with them. I really, really believe that. Because the idea is so sound, and eventually the execution is so beautifully realized that uh, it, it's a home run. So I'm gonna show you two clips from the same movie. The first, in a way, sets the idea up, and the second one is the resolution of the idea. And again, in a sense, it's also a tribute to cinema. And again, if it doesn't send you off this evening dancing and wanting to make movies, then there's not a lot I can do to help you. Anybody else? I think there was at least one other arm that went up. It seems like the mission was a pretty crazy film to pull off. When I even think about shooting in those conditions now, considering 30 years ago, I just am curious about how you draw people into that like you did. Okay, I think uh, at, at, at core, it's about self-belief. You know, Francois Truffaut said, you have to believe, this is a big ask, I know what I'm about to say, you have to believe I have something to say to the world that if the world will listen, it will be a better place. If the world will listen, I'm going to change a few things. You've got to believe that inside yourself. If you don't, no one else is going to, that's for sure. If anyone had said to me in 1979, when I started developing it, that Chariots of Fire would be financially the most successful film I ever produced, I'd have told them they were mad. It wasn't why I was doing it. I was doing it actually for all sorts of quite complicated uh, reasons. I certainly wasn't doing it because I thought it could be a box office hit. It all starts with self-belief. Somewhere in that room, at the moment, one of you is going to produce something extraordinary. I know it. I absolutely know it. Among the best films I've ever seen, and I tend to flip-flop a bit about what the best film I've ever seen is, but one of the best, certainly among the best ten I've ever seen, uh, is this. And then whenever I get depressed about cinema, or where cinema's going, or what cinema might do, I remind myself by running this. <laughs>
about to enter the most beautiful job in the world. There is nothing more fantastic than working with a crew hard on a film you believe in, a film that they believe in, and the sense of camaraderie and the sense of, 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 of central purpose and shared purpose is something which is actually beautiful. The only phrase I can use, only word I can use, it is beautiful. So you're entering a very, very, very privileged enclave, uh, one that's not a lot of people ever even get to. I think I mentioned earlier, I have never been to work in my life, ever. What I've done is the things that I've loved doing and I've bust a gut to do them well. I haven't always succeeded in doing them well, but I've bust a gut to do them well. You're about to enter exactly that world, a world which will offer you your dreams, but even when it's, re re as it were, even when it's rejecting you, it's still something you'll be plowing away at doing because you love it. If you don't love it, like that guy from IT said, if you don't love it, put your hand up now and leave because it's very demanding. It has moments of crushing disappointment. And unless you are very, very much in love with it, you will not finish the course. There's no question about that. Anyway, we all have to start somewhere. And mine was with Alan Parker. He'd, one day he, he phoned me up and he said, uh, I've decided that I don't like all this photographic stuff. He said, you've got to write a script for me. And I said, I can't write a script. I've never written anything longer than 30 seconds. So he said, no, no, you can do it. So uh, I wrote this script and miraculously uh, it got made. I mean, it was most peculiar the way we did it. I mean, it didn't even look like a script, you know. He sent me along another copy of the script and said, look, for God's sake, lay it out like this. He said, otherwise we'll never get the money. And that was the beginnings. The film was Melody, a low-budget story of young love directed by Warris Hussain and starring Jack Wilde and Mark Lester. On location, Barry Brown of the BBC interviewed the two tyros, Parker and Putnam. What we did to start with, right from the very outset, was to go around to schools and we tape recorded what they thought, what they said and everything, so that we didn't really just end up with how we thought that kids of 11 would react and whether they could fall in love or whether they couldn't fall in love or whether... It was the very first interview for television that we ever did and uh, we, Putnam wouldn't do it on his own, so he made me do it with him because he was too nervous. And the two of I always remember, we, we sat on this little wall with the Thames in the background. And uh, we were unbelievably bad. One of the interesting things is that uh, we were amazed how little had changed uh, from the 15 years, 16, 17 years since we were that age. We were like two dummies out of, a, out of Burton's window, you know. And uh, in the evening, I got this phone call from Barry Brown uh, saying, Alan, we've, uh, we've seen the film and uh, Putnam is dreadful. He is quite terrible. In fact, we're going to have to cut him out. And you were brilliant. You, you're just natural at this kind of thing. And I'm on the phone thinking, yeah, really? Yeah, OK. Uh, so he said, so what we're going to do, we're not going to tell David, but we're going to get you back and we're going to do a whole lot just on you. And I said, uh, oh, fine, great, terrific. That sounds very good. And suddenly, this voice at the other end said, you rat! And it was Putnam. He said, <laughs> I think he found out about me very quickly. You have to believe. You know, starting a film, you're starting a career, you have to believe. Because if you don't believe, why should anyone else anywhere care what you think? So you, it starts with that. So there's another point. People want people, globally. People want to be decent. What's happening in Syria, what's happening in other countries, is an aberration. It is not normal human behaviour. It's an aberration because people wish to be treated decently and to be treated with respect. If I left you with no other thought, is you have to respect your audience. They're aching to have your respect because they're aching to respect each other and aching to respect themselves. And I would argue that pretty well every film I've ever made, in one way or another, I was trying to address an audience that I had respect for, and which I thought I may have something useful to offer them. And I think that's what makes the job great. It's what it makes it immensely challenging. It's what makes it fraught with disappointment, uh, but the best job in the world. So in fact, we're dealing, what we're all opposing at the moment and having to deal with are a set of fantasies. A fantasy that, it, that would indicate that greed is more important than love. A fantasy that would illustrate that power is more important than love. A fantasy that would illustrate that religion is more important than love. So your job, our job, is to absolutely puncture that by establishing the fact that it is about the people in our lives, the people we love, the people we can help, the good we can do. 
if our films can say that and say it consistently and be a thorn in the, th a thorn in the side of people who would like a simpler world, then so be it. Our job is to be difficult because despite everything I've just said to you, I actually think cinema can represent hope, but it only will represent hope if you believe it and if you believe the medium is powerful enough to deliver that. So I, I would have thought for an overall set of a title for the whole set of series of seminars, yeah, the cinema of hope would be something that I'd be very, very comfortable with. See you very soon.